What's up? Welcome to a new episode of Movie Schmovie. This is episode number 344. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot. Uh, my name's Steve. I'm one of the co-hosts. And I'm always, I'm joined by... Ronaldo! Oh, wow. Coming in hot. See, now, if I just say and what John... What do you do now? Yeah. I'm going to sound like... I'm going to be like... like I, I would say that what Ronald just did was a little bit try hard, but I yeah, will yeah. still seem too low energy if I come in with and yeah. John. So you gotta gonna... you gotta come with something, man. And John, there you yeah, go. I love That's good. it. That's good. I love it. I love it. Caps it off you just right. To me. <laughs> uh, how you guys doing, man? Pretty good. Good, yeah. good to good see man. you guys, man. I miss talking about movies. And it's good TV to see and you. Stuff. And if you're only listening to this podcast, it's also good to just hear you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I hope That's those <laughs> listening share in that sentiment, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we've got some stuff to discuss in this episode. We kind of talked to uh, the past few about how we got, thankfully, got access to the Tribeca at Home series this year for their film festival. So at the top of the podcast, we're going to kind of go through some of the stuff that we saw there um, through their at home service or the option that they offer. Again, just a uh, note that's just one of the amazing things that have come about in this shitty past two and a half years that everybody's going on. Yeah. It's a small thing, but I think it's an amazing thing that, you know, we've been able to take advantage of and be a part of, but just people across the world in cases um, being able to take advantage of these like virtual arms of these film festivals. Um, it's just been a really cool experience to be able to do that. So yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about Tribeca uh, and their at home offerings. Um, and then we're going to kind of just go through a, you know, what we've seen otherwise, some movies, some TV series, catch up on some stuff that uh, have been scattered all over our watch lists over the past couple of weeks. But um did you guys have anything you wanted to jump into before we go Tribeca or or what? Uh, one one snippet of news that will make all the DC fanboys very happy. Um, Zack Snyder's uh, Justice League is coming to digital um, and will include the black and white cut um, Justice League in gray. Um, which is really cool, man. Like, you know, the fact that this is going to be accessible to people outside of HBO next now is going to be amazing. It's going to be in 4K. And if you get a service like Vudu or iTunes, it's going to be incredible sound. So you know, that's coming uh, July, um, early July, if I'm not mistaken. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, yeah. So that's 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 all I wanted to talk about in terms of news. Um, I guess we should mention the uh, the 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 Nev Campbell's saga has finally oh, come to yes. an end. <laughs> that she was, I mean, you know, we were we were suspicious that this was the beginning of a of a sort of predictable news cycle. I guess when when we first heard that she was sort of publicly parting ways with the Scream series, that she wasn't going to be in the sixth movie, it felt right. like mm -hmm. a bit of a a needless story if the story was just that she wasn't going to do it but the way that it was worded it felt like she was kind of calling them out in some strange way and saying that maybe they weren't paying or what she i can't remember the exact wording but there was something in there about not not feeling like she was getting what she was what her value was or something right. um and then and then yes yeah, so i guess it's been a month or something but they just announced that they've struck a deal with her and that now she's going to have an increased role in this and i can only wonder if like hayden pianetaire is sitting there going like shit i was about to be the the, <laughs> the lead of a scream movie um yeah. but no i you know i'm i'm vaguely interested in that i think that we've all agreed that the scream series is pretty consistent and that the most recent one even though i don't think i liked it as well as, as everyone else did i still agree that the that's a series where i'm i'm intrigued to see what they do next so if yeah. they if their plan was or their preference would be to have sydney Nev Campbell in the movie. I'm glad they struck a deal, but it does feel now like we not so much like we got took because we sort of knew this was what it was, but it does feel like, oh, this is one of those things where they just got a few headlines out of like hype for a movie that yeah. now is kind of back at the zero that we thought they were at, which is we all kind of assumed she would come back. So anyway. Yeah, yeah no, that's I think it's a good thing to have her there. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think it's important that so, so obviously I want to see anything that Sydney Prescott, I, I feel like she needs to be present somehow in these screen films, whether or not she's the focus of the movies. But I mean, there was a, there was a, a small part of me that was a little relieved um, that maybe she wasn't going to be in the, the, I guess the sixth one, but maybe come back later. 
Um, but I'm not convinced that the role in this one maybe is still not as large, but right. the end game being like, oh yeah, it's going to be a more prominent thing in the seventh film of this idea of this new trilogy that they're doing. Um, Cause it would be cool to kind of have this, like a bit of a pivot and kind of keep the series or kind of move it not in a whole new direction, but like really commit to a new cast of characters and not really have to rely on bringing back the legacy characters just to kill one of them off with every movie, which, you know, that, that is what it is. But uh, you know, them discussing like, you know, how the movie's taking place in New York now. And like, there's just, just some different things happening, Mm -hmm. which I'm just interested in. And the radio silence guys definitely, I thought did a good job with, you know, the, the most recent scream. It wasn't, I didn't love it, but I was, you know, it, it, I, I was, I enjoyed it. And um, I'd be curious to see what they can do further. As long as, as long as Stu is somehow in the mix with these movies, like there's, I don't even know, like that's fan service or whatever, but there's just too much of Matthew Willard involved in this stuff to like, for him to not be a part of these, this trilogy in some way. So I'm very curious if that pans out, but um, you know, even him speaking up on Nev's behalf and, you know, talking about the new trilogy at all the cons that he does and all these videos going viral with him and Skeet and Skeet being in the most recent one. It's just, it's just weird, you know, like there's force there's, ghost there's, Skeet. Yeah. Or something. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, there's, there's a way to do it and I don't know what the right way is, but I'd be curious if they figure it out, but yeah. Um, but, but good on her and good on them for making it right. And uh, I mean, she is the franchise um, outside of Ghostface. It, it's Sydney Prescott. She's a top, She's a, she's a, she's a top final girl, so don't don't put disrespect on that name. So I'm happy that they worked it out. You know, uh, Henry, my son was asking me about um, uh, like Scream recently. Not you know, he's pretty much at an age where he can watch that kind of stuff if he wants to, and especially when he has a friend over or he goes right. over to, for like a sleepover. I know they watch that 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 level of movie all the time. And right. He was talking to me about it, and I was sort of I got kind of into the Scream idea just talking to him about it. How it's like it's found a way around that whole thing that so many slasher series after the second or third version it's like well now every movie is partially about how this person keeps coming back or how right. you bring them back um and all of them have like some definitive moment where it seems like they've killed the, the the guy and then they have to like then they bring him back like jason especially has like three or four movies in a row after a while where it's all about the first 30 minutes is almost like, maybe I'm exaggerating, maybe it's only the first 10 minutes, but still they have to come up with an excuse. Well, now he gets struck by lightning and he comes back to life. Well, now they use magic or something. It's just, or yeah. it's, or it's sci-fi almost. It yeah, just, yeah, yeah. it's our, it like, the Scream series has found this way around that by having it be, it's not that the killers don't die. It's that, it's copycats after a certain point yeah, it's like and it's always it's always a whodunit you know which yeah, is goes back to like the earliest tradition of what would kind of become the slasher uh movie was the sort of you know those movies in the in the like early 70s that were like slashers but much more on the whodunit sort of yeah. ten, ten little indians idea so anyway no i think that there is a um there is a uh, uh a pretty, like I said, a consistency to these movies that always makes me wonder, like, the, the next one might have some incredible sequence in it or some big scare. And even this most recent one, which I didn't love, had a few moments that I still think about that where something that happens to somebody feels so visceral because of the way they draw out the scene. That kid who got killed in the house when he was there by himself, like, kind of in the middle of the movie, is yeah. a scene I think about all the time. <clears throat> so, that kind of yeah. thing. And, is, and, and was the most recent one just called Scream? Yes. So what are they calling the next one? Scream Two. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't. I don't really know. It's a good question. Scream I again. Any, like I think it started filming like last week or the week before. Oh wow. Uh, so I haven't seen any like leaks of like any like you know production stuff showing it, but I don't know if that it would even have it on at this point. But um, yeah. So we'll see what happens with that. So. Let's jump into Tribeca. I mean, Tribeca, uh, Tribeca. Um, I mean, again, every time we talk about these film festivals, you know, some of the stuff we've talked about during them for anybody interested in finding a way to watch these things when the service was offering like an at home option or things like that. But I mean, a lot of what we're talking about now, obviously, Tribeca is over. Um, I think Ronald mentioned one of the ones he had seen on our last episode um, while it was still kind of going on. But uh, the DOC. In, in, yeah, the DOC. In general, though, I just think, you know, we're trying to share some of the stuff we saw. Some of the stuff we're going to talk about is already on services that you could access now if, you, if you're if you interested in what we discuss. Some are coming soon to streaming services or having some sort of theatrical release um, of some kind. And, you know, if as we go through it, if, if you guys know that information, 
Uh, obviously, we'll share it as as we come across some of these. So I, I kind of grabbed some information about a couple that I wanted to mention um, that I saw. Uh, and some of them are available. Some of them are coming in the fall to streaming. But um, I don't know. Where do you guys where do you guys want to start? Well, um, there's one movie I saw that I think Ronald saw as well. And I hope I'm getting the name right, because all I wrote down was Xavier Roberts. But is it called Billion Dollar Babies? The the Cabbage Patch Kids yes. story yeah, we, or something? We like all that? saw that, yeah. Okay, um, is that the name of it? Billion Dollar Babies? Uh, yeah, Billion, billion Dollar the, Babies, the true story of the Cabbage Patch Kids. Patch kids yeah. Yeah. There you go. They're not dolls, Ronald. Mm. They are kids. not dolls. Um, well, I mean, I, I just want to start this off by saying, I, I, I think I told you guys that I watched the Claymation documentary. I don't know if either of you ever watched that one. Um, but that guy, too, like all these guys at some point say that they want to be the next Disney. I think that is yes. such a wild ambition, especially when you have such a narrow idea as these people have compared to what Disney mm. has, which is yes. increasingly everything. However... I think Xavier Roberts, if you know, if he's, he's going to make a, thing. if he's going to make a billion dollars on the, uh, this idea, Cabbage Patch Kids, he's, you know, th th there was some limitless opportunity for this guy. Now we find out he's maybe a little bit of a con man, but aren't 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 they all? Aren't all billionaires on some level? I don't know. <laughs> right. I found I found this documentary to be an interesting, satisfying watch, but I'll have to admit I watched it in like two or three chunks. I, I, mm. I didn't sit down and get enthralled with it and finish it. I was able to step away and get a few things done and come back to it. And then the next morning, finish it up. So it, it, it was interesting to me. And I liked the way that it sort of combined the story of the Cabbage Patch Kids with this kind of moment in capitalism in America where, uh, you know, people got, people were so lacking for like things to do i guess that they started to take this kind of shit seriously the yeah. idea of like having that toy the right toy under the tree on christmas morning um and what am, what am i going to tell my little girl if i can't have a cabbage patch kid under the tree you know like and this idea of people like mobbing each other and black friday all that stuff i thought that was an interesting thing to bring in that was like this larger statement about america and how much americans are ridiculous and and we suck um <laughs> On top of this ridiculous, almost unlikely story of Xavier Roberts' success with Cabbage Patch Kids, which they then add to by saying, well, maybe the idea is not really his. Um, and uh, yeah, I just thought it was a it, it had a lot. It had enough story to it for me to be a, a good documentary. Sometimes documentaries don't have that much to them. But this actually, you know, was was interesting all the way to the end, I thought. What did you guys think of this of the story? And also, how much do you remember this phenomenon and how, how it really did become like this huge obsession in our culture? I remember it so vividly because I remember um, I used to get watched by my, my um, older cousin and she was into both Cabbage Patch Kids and Garbage Pail. So I remember just the stickers being all over her wall and then in the corner in our bed was a cat, a couple cabbage patch kids with their like kind of <laughs> weird looking faces. And I, I, I thought that this documentary was just so fun, man. It's a ride and it really does a good job of giving some balance to it, like helping you see, you know, how the culture got so big, really giving some voice to the the, the person who may have been the origin of it. And then also the billionaire and also like, I love how all the moving parts were all included. Um, unfortunately, you know, some of the people aren't allowed to tell their story, um, but most of it was just fun. I, I really, really enjoyed it, man. It's, it was a good documentary. Yeah, I would recommend it too. I, I, yeah. I think entertaining is a good word, you know, like so a, a, just the kind of the scope of the idea, like all the points that John's already mentioned, but just the, the idea of, you know, the, the consumerism that was kind of born out of that early 80s, uh, like coming off of a recession and people actually having money to buy stuff, you know, and it kind of all kind of crossing paths at an almost perfect time for this idea and this this brand and this product. Um, but as interesting as that is, like, you know, the whole culture around what they were doing with the Cabbage Patch Kids, like the like the the hospital and like the the nursery and like the the land that they created around it like the you know the disney of it all um is just as interesting and like yeah i totally remember this i mean i think when they first launched i was probably a little young but you know when they really kind of were at their height 
you know, those couple years post, you know, what is it? 83, probably like mid eighties, 86, 87. Like I was at the right age and I can remember like all my, again, like all my cousins having them. I, I we definitely probably had one or two, um, but it's, it is, it is interesting and it's entertaining and it's kind of like, it, it goes by at a clip and it's just really kind of paced well. Um, the narration I thought was good too. Neil Patrick Harris narrates it, um, yeah. which is interesting because he also did that um, 8-bit Christmas movie on HBO Max, which is also like pure nostalgia so of good. like the the 90s. But, you know, um, I thought it was interesting that he did this as well. Um, but yeah, the I, I don't think there's any, I don't know. I hadn't, I was trying to look that one up because that was one of the ones I wanted to mention too, in terms of where, when it would be available. Um, it to me, it screamed like a Netflix doc, like it, mm -hmm. it would yeah. find like a perfect place on Netflix and would be a movie that would totally be trending on Netflix if and when you know it found a home there. I don't know what it's doing, but you know, Neil um, Patrick Harris's narration even feels like a format that you could move over to other things the way that he's yeah. like, Well, that's the way I remember it anyway. Totally. And it's like yep. uh, intro and outro through the television set. It almost feels like the toys that made us, but like a more in depth version. And it actually it it made me think of the Orange Years, the Nickelodeon doc that we uh yeah. watched the friends of the show, um uh Scott and oh my gosh, I'm spacing on the co director of uh, the Orange Years. What was his name? This is bad because we go out live this this video is just me hanging out there anyway <laughs> delightful guy past guest we'll we'll was it a adam adam i think it was adam yeah scott right. and adam yeah adam. adam loved them both uh just to have bad uh recall um anyway but like it made me think about how that documentary has a certain kind of um uh, like interest level to people that might be coming up and you know like every generation kind of ages into nostalgia for stuff yes, and this is yes. maybe further back in that 80s thing but the the staying power of this thing it is so unlikely and it is so weird i remember when they first hit my sister really wanted one and my mom was the type of mom who would make sure you had the thing that you wanted if she could get it um i, I don't think she was strangling people in in department stores though I, <laughs> yeah. I i'm not sure we didn't have mob connections or that something didn't maybe fall off a truck every now and then and end up in in our house um but no it, it, i remember my sister had like one of the legit ones with the birth certificate and stuff and that she really treated it nicely but by that time they definitely already had the the plastic heads it wasn't cloth heads yeah um i do want to just mention we've alluded to the the person who may have actually originated the design that was so endearing to some and and you know uh bizarre to others Others, but Martha Nelson Thomas's doll babies, which she made these fabric dolls. I found those dolls so much more engaging looking, the expressions on their faces and just their faces yep. were also, there, there was something, there was something different about that. Like I, I, the, the story of what happened between her and Xavier Roberts is interesting because it does seem like there was some level of acknowledgement on his part, yeah. just to keep things simple. Here's a guy who's made a billion dollars. He can shave some off, but supposedly she was able to put her kids through college or that's what she said anyway, with the settlement. So she kind of went off and said, but it is, it's, it's crazy to think that it was that much of a, you know, that letter that, well, anyway, I don't want to spoil the story for people, but I think that that, that part of the story, it, it, I was intrigued that they went into it at such, in such depth with Xavier Roberts having participation in the doc, like that he talks about it. And I guess he kind of says some things to try to save face, but it still feels like that's, this is kind of a, you know, this is kind of the ugly underbelly to this whole thing is that yeah. the, the actual yeah. story that we heard about this guy, it was a bit more of a con job. And, you know, the, the origin of this thing was that he kind of, he kind of basically took the idea while telling someone, hey, if you don't want to partner with me, I'm just going to take this idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just so, such a gangster move, man. It's such a right. weird... Huh. Yeah. Um, Nostalgia-wise, I wanted to bring up another documentary that's kind of the same lane, same time period. Uh, Butterfly in the Sky. I mean... It, it, yeah, I saw that too. LeVar Burton sort of uh oh okay hybrid I meant to watch documentary that one, but I haven't yeah kind of a hybrid documentary of like what what LeVar Burton was doing during that time but also a reading rainbow documentary I really really enjoyed it it's a really a love letter to that time period and kind of that that cool a niche that he created the the yeah. cool sort of like making reading cool and man, they they talked about a period that I always wondered about that I'd never quite really understood. And that's like once he hit it big, 
what the fuck did he do during the like Star Trek time? You know, right. like, and I, I distinctly remember, like, it felt like a Mandela thing where I was like, I remember him being on the set of Star Trek and talking about books. Right. I, did, I wasn't crazy. And there was actually footage of him working on the set of Star Trek as he was kind of, you know, on his breaks, he would film Reading Rainbow. It was is an incredible devotion to the show and wanting kids to read and things he fought for, like little things that he fought for that made such a cool difference. When when I remember seeing it, I was like, man, he has Reebok pumps on. He has like a cool rat. T- like, I remember all this stuff about him, like that just was different than anything I had, I had been watching on TV. And LeVar Burton really has a, has a place in my heart and a lot of kids and adults, because I, you know, it wasn't just kids that were watching that show. It was a lot of, it was it was a lot of adults that were watching it as well. Um, and his general impact on culture, which is very underrated. So, what do yeah, you think, think, Steve? No, I, I loved it. I thought it was great. Yeah, yeah I, was I so have good, a soft, man. yeah, definitely a very positive soft spot for that program and just the idea, you know, that it its existence for like a quarter of a, what is that? A quarter of a century, 25 years. Um, It's just, uh, it's also really interesting because, you know, the whole interview portion of it and and hearing him talk about it, you just instantly like reminded of like, what a great host, you know, what, what a great person he is. And like, um, and, and the other interesting thing is too, is like, they talk about it, they talk about it for reading rainbow, but I mean, there's also a little bit of conversation about like the approach to using television to teach kids about books, you know, like you kind of go in the door that's open to kind of show them another room that is like also as warm and welcoming. And I I really like that piece of it too, because that was so effective and, you know, for in terms of access and, you know, different parts of the country, like people that, you know, didn't have access to books, like seeing it on a screen and hearing him read the book to you yeah. um, or kids read the books to kids. That's just like a really special thing. And like seeing it being talked about again, um, it just kind of makes you feel warm inside. And like, like, especially in the fire that we're living in right now, it's like, you know, it's a simpler approach to a thing that's like, there's just pure positive motivation in something like that. And, yeah. you know, the impact is, is felt to this day. And um, yeah, it's a great, I, I get that. The, the thing I was going to mention was like, I feel like the list I made, I think I only watched documentaries. I think I watched one, Same. I, I watched, watched one feature and the feature was probably what I liked the least of what yeah. I saw, yeah, but yeah. there's some, there were some really great docs and, and yeah, those two were kind of at the top of my list. The other one I wanted to mention um, I don't know if you watched this one, Ronald. Uh, Thirty-eight at the Garden. No, what's that? that one. That was the um, the Justin Lin doc. No. The you know the Nick the Jeremy Lin. Uh, Jeremy Lin, sorry, yeah, Justin Lin. Uh, Jeremy Lin. Yeah, that's the oh one that, he, that HBO. Lin Sanity. Has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're talking about that 11-12 season. Oh my like, god! Like his rise to stardom. It's it's a. It's not a feature length. I think it's like 50 some minutes. It's going to be that. That's when I did find is going to be on um, HBO. Um, I guess it's going to be on HBO, like proper HBO at some point this summer, I think they said, but on HBO Max in the fall, or they're going to have some kind of premiere for it. It's one of the HBO sports docs, but um, I thought it was great. And just like, just okay. Great in the sense of like talking about his impact on the league, on the Asian American culture. And it does this really interesting thing about like examining, you know, the representation in a sport like the NBA or, you know, an organization like the NBA and and how it ties to a lot of the hate crimes that are happening all over the world mm. in this country, especially with Asian Americans um, and the, the frequency and regularity that you see like an icon, quote unquote, an icon, like he really kind of yeah. was that season for that culture and those kinds of, you know, that 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 type of person who's watching the NBA and watching a, a player that looks like Jeremy Lin be a star, you know, and it's not very common. And uh, yeah, the Lin sanity of it all, um, they kind of, you know, it's, it has some really good interviews in it. And uh, and he's, and, you know, he's, in, he's just a really interesting guy. And I thought it was really uh, a cool little doc. I don't know if it's it's not one of the 
what does HBO do the the ringer docs I think they do have some of the ringer docs but it's not a ringer doc it, I think oh. it's just an HBO films documentary but definitely check that out um you would definitely be into that for sure I thought you might have track that one down i i did not know that was a part of it i mean like man linsanity is a very specific time like so you know that was when i was like going out a lot and i distinctly remember especially like when i first started doing stand-up there were people who weren't watching any basketball didn't know anything about basketball where when the knicks games came on you turn that shit on, you watch Jeremy right. Lin do his thing. Yeah. It was crazy. It was a crazy time, man. Like hearing people talk about a man who 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 didn't get drafted. You know, he kind of worked his way. It, that's another thing. So, like, typically for anybody who doesn't know M- NBA stuff or any professional like, sports, like you typically me. get get drafted. <laughs> so the so the idea is you go to the NBA draft or NFL draft, and you come from a college. And then you get drafted to the NBA to play. A team picks you. He did not have that opportunity. He just kind of went to a couple camps, worked really hard, played in a D league and worked his way up. And then on top of that, he's super religious in a good way. And and really, whenever he spoke, he had this incredible positivity that was also backed by God, which was really cool. Um, So his run was insane man so we had so we had the religious people he had the people right. that just were interested in the spectacle then you know the asian community was behind him so it was like this like ruckus sort of feeling every time you saw him on the screen it, yeah. Yeah, i mean and, and this, is, it, this is super interesting like beyond what ron like he's harvard educated he went to harvard on a non-athletic super scholarship smart. like super smart, man. very smart and yeah. was one of if not the first i think Asian Americans to win an NBA championship a few years late after that, but he won it. He didn't win it with the Knicks. He won it with the uh, Raptors. But it's just like that 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 first nature of you know yeah. uh, of of the representation in the league and kind of seeing um, his rise. I mean, that specific year, uh, the eleven twelve season was like really kind of what the doc is focusing on. But they definitely addressed the rest of it. But yeah, I definitely recommend that too. And again, that'll be. That'll be on HBO and or HBO Max. Um, I think late summer, early fall is what I found on their uh, press site. Cool. John. Uh, I watched another doc that was um, interesting, but uh, kind of monotonous and like had had high points, but also felt to me like it needed. I, I've, I've discovered that I'm not that into like diary format docs like i like for there to be that extra bit of like remove that's a little bit more objectivity maybe you know rather than a per- seeming like it's it's narrated by the person it's about right. sort of but this right. is a film called lost weekend uh a love story i believe is it? yeah the lost weekend a love story and it's a um it's a doc about um john lennon's affair with uh may pang his, his oh, right. assistant who like he and yoko kind of split and yoko calls may pang to her office and says uh, uh or maybe not to her office but just takes her aside and says uh you know i want you to date john he needs to date somebody who's going to be nice to him like you would be and may pang is sort of taken aback but then eventually she becomes john lennon's girlfriend and for a couple of years they have this affair that you know bridges a, a tumultuous time in his life but also a creatively fertile time in his life when he was kind of making some key adjustments and people tend to call that period of his life the lost weekend because after that he was at least supposedly clean and sober for a little while and mm-hmm. you know the last few years of his life he was kind of trying to get back to the some some simplicity of being a father and a family man and like you know i don't know how you know how well he did that but he was back with yoko and um mm-hmm. anyway th- th- this is a chapter that has been talked about a lot but not usually at least not in the modern era. I think May Pang has actually written a couple of books. And this this movie feels like a a really good like uh iMovie slideshow with someone reading a book over it. I mean, you know, and it's got yeah. some interview clips in it, but it needs more historical context. It needs more like if May Pang were sitting there talking to a to a documentarian or talking past the camera and you felt like this wasn't sort of her story, it wouldn't feel so like this is just a person who's kind of telling the story of everything she knows about what happened with her and John Lennon. And it's interesting, but it, it kind of tests the limit of 
how interesting it is, how thirsty you might be for like intimate details about a famous person. And, you know, John Lennon, the inner life of the Beatles in general, there's a lot of people that are just innately interested in that. And I think some people might really appreciate like the very thing I'm saying kind of put, puts me off, which is that diary aspect. I right. think some people might be drawn in by, but it feels just a little, uh, not quite like whatever that kid 90, was that the name of the uh, Soleil Moon Fry? Yeah. Soleil yeah. Moon Fry, yeah. Like, like that to me felt like, uh, uh, like a really heavily like unpolished thing because it was so much just her point of view and it was almost like a a puff piece of or, of sorts of, that from her point of view. This feels is a little bit more of a real movie, but it still has that feeling of just this is May Pang's story, and and you know like Yoko Ono really does does not come off well in this. Um, uh. And yeah, it's got inconsistent access and it's like the music it's you could tell they only have the rights to use a few snippets of John Lennon's actual music at different points. And the rest of the time, it's this kind of sound alike instrumental yeah. stuff. It just feels there's something about it that doesn't feel fully uh, like essential. But it, I did come away from it with a better understanding maybe of the kind of person. Uh, you know, problematic person. I've known about his abuse uh, of women in some relationships. And that's, you know, that so the colors in that side of John as someone who really was flawed, but also really does seem to be like uh, kind of serious about trying to rehabilitate himself. So, I mean, a, 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 an interesting portrait, but not a great documentary. And it does have a couple of kind of sweetly powerful moments where it's just all about how close these people were to him. And like, there's a moment late in the movie that, you know, is sweet and kind of powerful in its way, but um, yeah, there was something just a little. It needed a, it needed a, a, a an outside person to take this material and shape it into something because th there are some interesting recollections and there are some interesting stories about stuff that I don't know that I'd heard before about you know like John and Paul meeting up and jamming and stuff in 1975, like the fact that that was the last time they ever played together. And there's some really crappy recordings of a really horrible version of, uh, I forget what song they were playing, but like Stevie wonder is there, but you can, it's like, it's really not coming together. And so it's kind of <laughs> like, well, it's cool to hear this, but it's also like, well, maybe there's a reason why, you know, <laughs> never, yeah. you've never heard it till now. Um, I actually, I actually saw it too. Um, oh, what do you think I, of it? I loved it, but oh, really? also like, I don't, I'm not, I don't know anything of the personal matters of like Yoko and John Lennon and I don't know any of that. So a perspective that was a little outside of that was interesting to me. Toward the end really starts to get into the thing you're talking about. Like within the last half an hour is, it, it should have maybe been just an hour because maybe. the part that you're talking about starts to feel like there's too much of it. Like it feels like a documentary was being made and it was a story that they wanted to tell about this. They got her involved and she was like, I have to be involved in this. I have to like randomly be in it and hug his son. <laughs> I have to like, you know what I mean? Like it, it just, that part of it, I didn't like, but the first hour and some change I thought was really fucking cool. Like the, I, I think that sometimes with him, he's so precious to a lot of people that his humanity isn't really talked about in that way. And I think, it, you know, just, I don't think she said anything that felt terrible about him. You know, like you said, they, there's a lot of shitting on Yoko Ono, but <laughs> yeah, she comes, off, she, she comes off like a tyrant, yeah. like a tyrant almost. So if you, if you're good with the idea that Yoko is going to get slandered for an hour and a half, watch it. Cause it's, it's pretty juicy in that way. Cause I, I'm telling you, John, I didn't know anything about this. I see. I guess you know, to me, it is interesting that it's like this is the account that we're getting, and it's a it's another woman. It's like it's at least it's not a man. If it was a man slandering Yoko, oh, it would feel sort of unsavory. So weird. But the fact that like and the also like the age difference is not huge. It's a ten year age difference. I mean, I guess that's pretty yeah. big. But like, uh, you know, John Lennon was was ten years older than May Pang, and she was like nineteen when they met. And that's you know that's another. Uh, issue that yeah. doesn't really get into with this documentary, but it's also crazy that he was only forty when he died, and when you yeah. consider the life he had up till then. Why uh, did she do so many died, interviews? Murdered, huh? Why did she do so many interviews? I can only guess that she I can't. She, she wrote two books, so Steve, I, can, I bet she was. I bet she was going on talk shows to talk about her books. Yeah. This woman did like ten, like super personal interviews about John Lennon and they weren't like 
Yeah, jo- jo- it was like, yeah, so. One of them is on the Alan sex. Thick show, which was a, a show called Thick of the Night. He had a talk show in the, <laughs> yeah. in the 80s, I think. Um, and Alan Thick is like asking crazy personal questions, yeah. like questions that you wouldn't be allowed to ask anymore. The ones that are like borderline, like, yeah, I don't think you need to know about their sex life. I don't think you need right. to know about how a stroke is or something like it's just very weird i don't want to know <laughs> but anyway uh well that's oh. interesting so but I, I guess i i can see how maybe i do know maybe for me the uh-huh. beatles thing like it has to be something really special for me to i mean i, I hadn't even right, thought right, about right. that because i i but i didn't know that much about this so i do think mm. that maybe there was a way that this there's so, probably something that would have Please, both of us, that would have been a slightly more, yeah. tight, just a more tightly put together documentary rather For than sure. kind of like, because there were some stories where it would be like, uh, then we went to the beach and I took some pictures. He was wearing my hat. And that would yeah. be like the whole thing. That That's would be like the, the whole, yeah. as though we're supposed to just be so, oh my God, amazed that you mean that famous picture you took? He's wearing your hat? Oh my gosh. But like yeah. there were some intimate moments and snapshots and stuff that did feel like, oh, it's cool to see this. I mean, again, like I said, there's a certain level of interest in the Beatles. So yeah, um, yeah. I think for some people, this could be really interesting. But you're right. Maybe at an hour, it would be the right It'd be perfect, right, the right pace. Yeah. And it wouldn't feel so much like she was just kind of opening her journal and reading all the stuff that was in it about John. Yeah. Lennon. Interesting but, uh, stuff. Um, so you, got, you guys said you watched a narrative film or two. I watched a couple. I don't know if you guys saw anything you liked. You said you said that you liked the docs better by far, right, Steve? I- yeah, I only saw one other a narrative called Employee of the Month, which mm. was was like a oh, dark I saw comedy. that too. Yeah, I, I, I liked it. I liked it. I just like the docs more. I, I don't really know much about that movie though. I couldn't find any release patterns for it. But uh, um, yeah, I don't know. I saw a movie. horror film. Which one? Rounding. Oh, I saw that. <laughs> okay, we're, um, call, we're calling that a horror film. <laughs> I mean, that's what. <laughs> no, I know. I'm just saying, like, I feel like the movie itself tries to play with that idea that, that what yeah. you're watching is either like a medical drama or a psychological thriller or a horror film. And uh, I think that it has, you know, it has varied success with those different threads, I thought. But um, look, but it was interesting. I'm, you know, it was look, just adding tribal drums and having random people and makeup in the middle of the hall doesn't mean you're a fucking scary movie like. I don't know what this was trying to do in terms of the scary part of it, but I really could understand a medical professional having something happen that haunts him in this way. And I think they should have just hit on that because it, it the tension of of just a person making a mistake or, or perception of a mistake haunting them for the rest of their professional career really is a cool idea because I, I honestly haven't seen anything like it like this but it it really was boring as fuck if i could be completely honest it was a fucking bore fest and 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 they're like this this guy's made a an incredible horror film before this that was like touted as one of the the next best um you know horror directors and then this comes out and it's just (laughs) a boring boring fucking movie man so the director of let's look this up now because I I, I yeah because it, it's just like a big deal it was like oh this the second movie from this hard director let's see what I mean and it was the the comments that people were putting about this movie was like I should be on the edge of my seat I'm gonna poop myself I'm gonna fucking go crazy and I was okay not... so Alex Thompson didn't he direct Saint Francis was that the thing he that's did the, that's the one yeah yeah. Um, you know, I didn't see that one, but I have heard it was great. I did mm. find this really, I guess I kind of agree with a lot of the things you said, Ronald. I might have, I might have seen it a little bit differently in the sense that it's like, it's, it's, it reminds me of another movie I've seen recently that was not a Tribeca movie, but I'll just throw out there the movie Watcher is another movie. I want to see that. that. That really plays with that idea of like, is this an unreliable narrator or not? You know? Oh, you're and right, I think right. rounding and both movies have a different approach of how to answer that question. Uh, at like, what's the last act of the movie? I feel like rounding had some kind of interesting things going on with it. Like there was a, there were two kind of climactic twists, one of which I didn't really think worked very well. Um, and one of which I thought, uh, was a little bit more interesting where the story was going with the kind of medical drama. I thought that was actually could have been delivered better. I feel like the the climactic 
twist, though, got lost in this kind of muddled ending where what you were talking about, Ronald, where it's trying to throw some horror imagery at us that really never connected. And in fact, oh. the effects on in that area were so weird. It was like it was like the bad version of the sort of creative effects in Attack the Block. You know how like the monster design in that is yeah. kind of cheap, but it feels creative and works. Yeah. The, the, there's like a creature design in rounding that really just I feel like they linger on it too much and it's not really clear if it's even supposed to look like something real but th they're using like visuals to depict like either someone's mind decaying or some kind of supernatural occurrence and I don't think either one works that well cinematically when you compare it to the other part where like you have this kind of emotionally aloof guy who met, he really doesn't have very good bedside manner I mean we're not used to seeing this kind of character where it's like he's not that competent he you can see that he's not going to do that good of a job as a doctor but he's being given this chance at this amazingly permissive hospital <laughs> that lets him go around and just do some wild shit um but yeah i i kind of agree with you ronald that like if it had simplified what it was trying to do we might have gotten a kind of compelling psychological medical drama that sort yeah. of makes you question okay how can someone who's dealing with these types of issues possibly be expected to fulfill the duties of being a medical professional and like how would the system weed out somebody who was just un, you know unable to function in this way and and i think like the way his body's breaking down as well as his mind um i thought that stuff was effective but yeah it's boring and it it's at the end it, i really think it lost a lot of steam in the last few minutes because what it was trying to do at the end it just didn't quite pull off you know like it did you you know what I mean? Like yeah, whatever it, it was it, trying to do, it kind of went too far or not far enough or something. And then it had some really weird dodgy effects, which is always strange to end on like a weird effect. Yeah, the buildup was so crazy. I was like, yeah. oh, oh, what's gonna happen? And then it just like, oh, this. All right, I guess. Uh, I don't know. Interesting. But that actor was interesting in the sense of what he made you do, made you worry about his character. I do think I don't know if that was like a great performance. What's the guy's name? Um, uh, 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 I'm trying to pull it up, but um, you know what his face looked like, Steve. Um, if if someone were texting and they walked into a, a caution wet floor, and and was like perpetually slipping, it's like a. <laughs> I'm seeing it. It I'm was like that. For, just like that. That was his face the whole movie, and I and it, it was making me uncomfortable because it didn't seem to be like in in between namir smallwood is the name of the, yeah. the actor um and yeah i i thought he was like he was doing a good job of playing a very off-putting character i thought and i kind of wish yeah. the movie had supported and i also wish some of the supporting characters could have been fleshed out a little bit more because there were some moments where like that the the like the the head physician uh played by michael potts i think um is you can't tell whether you're supposed to think he's a good doctor or whether he's horrible or not because he kind of is like he's, he's being babied well it's questionable that he's bringing that but i'm talking about like the doctor at the hospital oh, that, keep, okay. that keeps him on it's yeah. like it's questionable that he shouldn't have been let go like the first day the way that things yeah. progress anyway I, I wonder if a medical professional would watch this movie and go holy shit, this is completely detached <laughs> from reality um but um, I, I watched another movie that I guess might purport to be a horror movie, and this is the last thing I watched at the fest, which is uh, A Wounded Fawn. I don't How know was it? Know, but... well, I mean, this is one where I looked and I saw, I just wanted to see if what other reviewers were saying because I wondered if I kind of missed something. Um, but there's like, it's got 100% with like 10 different reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. And I can only How? assume... I can only assume these are all small outlets like us that were given access like us. And these yeah. people maybe were looking at the artistic merits of this movie because I found this movie to be like, there's other movies I might mention in a minute that were not festival movies that were like movies that might test your, your desire to like, like artistic intention and whether it's going to overwhelm the entertainment value of a movie or your interest in the plot of a movie. And sometimes, and we've had that discussion on the show dating back the most memorable instance, I think was when uh, only God forgives how much Steve had like a, a physical allergic reaction to that movie and how much, but I mean, it started that broader subject of like, well, if a filmmaker's goal is to make you unsatisfied and uncomfortable, does that, you know what I mean? Like not to say, should you like it or not, but do you view it as a successful experiment? If a director takes you on a ride that is clearly not meant to be, fun but maybe there's people that do find a movie like this fun but i thought a wounded fawn was like 
really kind of up its own ass, you know, in, in terms of just the runtime and what happens in it. I like the idea. It sort of takes sort of a horror movie scenario of like a killer is taking a woman out to the middle of nowhere to potentially mm. kill her. And, and, um, you know, he's got all this bizarre, uh, like occult underpinnings to his, uh, stuff that's like rooted in Greek myth and it's got a little bit of a heightened kind of arch sense of humor that makes you think early on, oh, maybe this movie's going to be kind of a fast-moving, weird, arty thing. But then it just really slows down once it gets out to the the cabin in the woods kind of scenario. Mm. And at that point is when it kind of falls in love with its own uh, idea of, you know, using imagery from Greek myths and mixing it in. And, and it is all about turning the tables on the aggressor in this situation. And so I do think there's a feminist angle to it that is like, interesting and fresh and i think the guy's name is travis stevens the guy who directed this um uh, a wounded fawn is directed by yes travis stevens and he too has uh has like a pedigree what was the movie he did that everyone liked uh or at least i remember people talking about jacob's wife um which I've, i haven't seen but i've i've heard about being good or at least interesting anyway i, I do think that i want to i want these d directors who have a point of view especially if they're working in genre uh, I want them to have movies that I enjoy more than this. <laughs> you know, like I, I got to the end and I sort of got it and I did hang in there to the end and it does kind of make you watch to the end of the credits in an interesting way, but it also is kind of bludgeoning and I think it's just a shade over 90 minutes and it really felt like it was way longer than that just because of how 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 quickly it goes off into art film land. Um, and it almost seems like if it had stayed a little bit more rooted in like a grounded storyline, it might have had the, like the performances and the atmosphere and the imagery might have really, might've really been something special. But yeah, for me, it just, it kind of bored, bored my pants off. Mm. I haven't, I can't even find oh. my pants. Damn. Just bored them right off. Yeah. Steve, rattle off the other movies that you saw and I'll rattle off some that I've seen. What, what else did you um, see? So I also watched uh, American Pain um okay. documentary that is a I, I think this one's also going to be on hbo max or it could be on cnn i don't know what service they would put it out on but it's a co-production um who about these two brothers who basically had like a franchise of pain clinics in florida and it's just oh, kind of right how was it the, it was really good it, it's i mean topically it's like a horrible yeah. topic but i'm just like you know, the idea of um, we talked about this at a couple other festivals, like these docs about like how easy pain medicine is access, you know, like how prescribing these and distributing these pills, you know, like they're candy, basically. And, um, you know, the motivations for these brothers and some of the other stakeholders that they were working with and just kind of about that whole rise and fall. Um, but I thought it was a really interesting doc. Um, I also saw. What was that one called? Um, Leave No Trace, which is really hard to watch. Um, I, I mean, only because it's something that probably touches so much of the <laughs> our generation. And, you know, I don't mean to say that uh, when you hear what it's about, but it's a uh, it's a documentary. It's actually on Hulu now um, about the uh, sexual abuse claims that came about uh, with the Boy Scouts of America. Oh, and, wow. Um, basically the, oh uh, my God, it's just, it's just really disgusting. Um, but like, just, uh, I, I want to say the number was a $2.7 billion, um, agreement that they came to, I think it was like over 8,200 claims of, um, abuse from kids that were a part of the Boy Scouts and mm. just kind of about how it's snowballed into this thing about, you know, once, once someone, came out and talked about it like all these other things were coming about and um and it kind of focuses on a handful of of subjects in the doc but um you know it's kind of, it's it's i thought it was a really well made documentary it's the pacing is a little off at times but um definitely something i didn't have any i, I mean at least in the, the scope of it i had no context or awareness that this was a thing i mean i know the boy scouts and the girl scouts have kind of come under fire in the last five to ten years uh for this and other things but i never realized the the how i guess how many uh claims and you know cases there were specifically that they're that, that are addressed in this documentary but that's called leave no trace and that's on <clears throat> that's on hulu now uh came out 
on Hulu during the during the uh, festival. Um, I think that was the only, only ones I really wanted to mention um, that I saw. We talked about Butterfly in the Sky, uh, yeah. but yeah, um, that, that's pretty much all mine from the from the fest. Cool. Um, there were a couple I wanted to mention. Uh, this documentary, Carol and Johnny, which was a documentary about a boyfriend girlfriend bank robber team mm -hmm. they robbed over 200 banks they just oh, were yeah. i saw that it's too, a yeah. it's an incredible story just because the motivation was just they the guy didn't want to work anymore and he's like i'm gonna rob banks and all all he wanted his girlfriend to do was drive the car um so he would essentially rob the banks kind of have a meeting point that wasn't near the the, the place he'd run over to it they'd escape and they did this all over the country for decades until one day they just got caught um, because they stayed in one place for longer than they should have. They would have gotten away with it. It's a, it's a strange thing. So um, he did something like 30 years and she did 15 or something like yeah, that. 15. And, and it's a story about it, it basically follows right when he gets out and wanting to see her and in mm. his life after that it's a it's really interesting he wasn't the nicest guy to her um but it's it's definitely worth checking out man um this guy really wants to make a new life for himself but he's he he tries he tries to self-destruct he kind of self-destructs a couple times so it's cool to watch his journey um two other documentaries i saw are endangered which is uh, about journalism in three or four places and how it's it's basically criminal to tell the truth and how hits have been put out on journalists and in the, the 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 chance that people take to tell the truth and how it's constantly obstructed uh in in countries that you wouldn't expect um, it's really good. It's on HBO Max right now. Worth checking out. And the last documentary I'm going to talk about is one called Katrina Babies, mm. uh, which follows um, a guy that, uh, you know, went through Katrina, who had the idea that maybe he should check up on people and see how they felt about it. Because, And then you realize when he starts to interview people that they've never been asked about how they felt about Katrina. Like, literally watching their homes get demolished, watching dead bodies in the water, watching their whole, you know, a town get destroyed, had never been asked how they felt about it. Uh, so that's really cool to, to see that he, you know, he had the heart to kind of reach out to these people and, and see how they felt about it. And uh, in the whole women's rights sort of area, uh, I saw a movie called Cherry, um, that was about a woman who finds out that she's pregnant and it's about like the next day or so after she's pregnant, she decides what she wants to do. It's, it's about agency. It's about the, the divine feminine and, and all the beautiful things that come with the power of, of being a woman. And it's, you know, it's a simple tale that's super silly, uh, in some ways and very serious in others, but uh cherry's worth checking out it's you know it's 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 very artsy mm -hmm. but it's just a, a, a girl that works at a magic store gets fired and she finds out that she's pregnant right kind of at the same time that she gets fired um so that, that you know that's that's worth checking out i don't i don't know when it's coming out it doesn't seem to have any distribution but uh look up tribeca cherry and you can watch the trailer but that's that's my Tribeca. I watched way more movies than I thought after mate, rattling off those things. So well, it feels good to mention things you've watched. That's yes. This, this whole show is built on the premise Goodness. that we watch things and then we like to mention them, and then I've you purge get to hear my us, soul of them. Right now, you're done. Now, now I'm you can done, be free, man. and your brain can be like like I I, I choose. To, I want to have as empty a brain as possible when this when this show is over. Yeah, man. 
get that shit out of my head. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about something else. I guess we must have all watched while we were on a break. Uh, uh, Obi Wan wrapped up its season, and I really was interested to hear what the two of you thought once we had, you know, because you really don't know until you get to the end of one of these mini series or whatever you want to call them. Like, what was that? Was that a movie that? that was stretched out was that a show that worked as the format they gave it um you know i think we had all talked as recently as maybe episode four or five of obi-wan so i know we were all saying that you know what what had started strong for us had sort of uh, like kind of kept us hooked but also kind of pushed us away as it was going along and we were no longer we were no longer putting this show in the contender for like oh this is the one that really fires us on all cylinders and, and really works um how do you guys feel after seeing the finale episode of Obi-Wan Kenobi's uh, first season? I don't know if that was first of many or there's talk of a season two, but let's just call this the end for now. What did you think of the end of Obi-Wan Kenobi, Steve? Eh, I don't know, man. Like, it, I, I just, I can't help but like come off of this feeling again, like why? Uh, you know, I think there's some things that were in this season that I liked, you know, there's some c scenes that I liked and it's always nice to see, uh, you know, you and as that character, cause I, I love that. I love the character of Obi-Wan Kenobi. And I think he's incredible as Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, a bright spot of the prequels for sure. So even just seeing that piece was, was a good experience for me. I didn't dislike the series. I just kind of come away from it, just feeling like it's a, it's a very neutral experience all around. It's like, I'm not really feeling like I'm getting anything at it. Uh, there's nothing really kind of uh, being enriched for me, like whether it's Obi-Wan or Darth Vader, maybe a little thing here or there. But even like the things that we see with Leia and and Luke and meeting new characters, I, I just feel like, you know, it, it, it felt very, very clearly to me like this was something that was drawn out even at six episodes. And if anything should have, should have, if it could have ever been, uh, you know, a movie, you know, it should have been a Star Wars movie. The fact that Star Wars now, and I've been talking to my coworker about this, like this, the, through the whole season, like the idea that Star Wars exists as television series now on a Disney streaming service is just like a ridiculous sentence to say out loud. <laughs> and, um, you know, it just constantly reminds me of, of what feels like a really mishandling, mismanagement missed opportunity to really capitalize on what seemed to be you know a launch pad that the force awakens kind of came with when it when the when the new trilogy came out and I, you know i don't know the last jedi being as divisive as it was and you know obviously rise of skywalker kind of being a pretty big miss in my opinion i just really can't believe that you know with the exception of the mandalorian there's really nothing happening in Star Wars, at least personally, that I find to be all that exciting. And, you know, even what they've announced and spoke on so far, even to this point, you know, that we're recording this, this podcast, it's like, it's all television. The only thing that you really hear any talk about or any kind of real comment on is, you know, Taika's Star Wars movie, which feels like, you know, that's the one that they've really even kind of acknowledged is happening for sure. And seems to be, you know, the next one to happen in the film space. Um, and obviously, and, I'm, and that I'm, supposedly set at, in, in the open, free, clear zone right, of right. the end of, of, the, of Rise of Skywalker, or, right. right? Which right. I think that's something that is getting harder to take. Is that any story they're they're talking about is usually hacking away at some increasingly small piece of a timeline that has gotten filled in, you know, yeah. retroactively. So, and I mean, but that's that's more exciting to me, though. Like, you know, even the the, the piece that they've acknowledged with that, if that holds to be true, you know. Uh, there's only so much that's going to happen in an Obi-Wan series. That's going to bridge a piece of story that I know a beginning and an end to, you know, like right. I, the, the middle could be interesting, but I don't know that this was that at all. You know, I, I don't even really see that as, you know, this series as a middle. Um, so, you know, there's not enough there for me to like, you know, really kind of say in, in book of Boba Fett is even worse or is it even better example of how it didn't work? Yeah. You know, and but then you say, oh, okay, well, um, you know, there's an Osaka series, there's a some sort of Rebel series, there's that Skeleton Crew series, like there's all these things coming. But the only one, you know, if it really truly gets away, I mean, I, I need to see, I want to see these movies again. Yeah. You know, I, I'm all yeah. about the series if it if it is enriching a story that, 
you know, as a standalone or, you know, um, a new idea. Um, you know, even though the Mandalorians dipped into the Skywalker stuff and, you know, kind of plays on the idea of a baby Yoda character. Right. Um, it, 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 the Mandalorian is a huge hit and it's, and it's like the major success that star Wars has had in the really since force awakens. Yeah. And I just feel like if they're going to go for something new with Taika's film, I'm very excited to see that because that's something that I don't know. You know, that's something in a, in a, in a space that I, I, I'm not like trying to forget that I know pieces <laughs> of this story already to enjoy this little sliver that they're giving me. I can enjoy the thing as a whole, like as a, as a meal, you know what I mean? Like I want that um, to kind of get away from this stuff and just, it just, it just feels like maybe it's just been, it, it just, it's, it's enough. And I guess is what I'm getting at as, as a long winded answer. And, and this series, I think, is even with two of the best characters in Star Wars, still did not feel like it was anything special to me, to be honest. I don't know. What, what do you guys think? Ronald? Um, you know, I've, I've expressed my doubts about this season and how it felt and the, the ups and downs. And, and sometimes it feeling like sort of scene based writing, like where you, you have yeah, a scene. I, t- you I totally agree. Out. Um, you know, here's the, here's the biggest problem I have. This is better than Boba Fett, but I didn't like it a ton. And it has one of the best lightsaber fights I've seen in Star Wars motion picture history in yes. any movie, period. It's weird. It's weird. Cause I, cause like, because of that, when I talk about this show, I'm like, but it had the best one so, of the best lightsaber fights. So, so just I, 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 I don't want to I don't want to knock you off course. You're talking about the final one, right? In the, the final in the fight yeah. is one of the best films. I, I loved it. Ever. I loved it. I, I got so much Star Wars juice out of that scene. Yeah. And in terms of like, I think if like Obi Wan standing there and all the rocks flying up behind him might be the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm not sure, <laughs> but like. I loved the idea that like that they, they 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 didn't give us that when, when they took us back to Luke in the Last Jedi. That's what a lot of people wanted to see was Luke being like the the best Jedi we've seen, you know. Yeah, yeah. And like we didn't we did, we got something different. We got something deeper. Uh, something that a lot of people, including myself, think maybe was even more of a show of power. What Luke does at the end of that movie is at least philosophically very powerful and more imaginative than just him him being strong. But it was so great to see the Obi Wan, not the animated Obi Wan, but the on screen Obi Wan played by Ewan McGregor, get to open up like that and and. The, the dynamics of the fight between them, I just found that really interesting. And like, but the best character stuff maybe of the whole show was the stuff that came out in that little, in that fight. You know, I, I just thought that was, I just thought that was like such a high point that it made me wish that we had gotten really the movie that would have led up to that moment. And then I think yeah. they could have set up some of the choices that are made. Surprise folks, Obi-Wan doesn't kill Darth Vader um, in this movie. Uh, I think they really could have built up to his pivot, his decision not to kill Darth Vader. I think that could have been a real heavy emotional moment rather than feeling like, oh, they they ticked the boxes to make it so that we can imagine why he wouldn't kill him. But it still seems like such an oversight that he didn't kill him a second time when they could have given some plot reason or some urgency. Like their their, their battle earlier in the season where Darth Vader kind of you know, leaves Obi-Wan burned up and then just walks away. I feel like that scene lacked an urgency to it too. It's like, it didn't feel like it ended for any reason outside of just Darth Vader going, Hmm. All right. Well, I'll see you. And this felt like at the end, Obi-Wan was like, Oh, all right. Well, I'll see you. And I think they could have gotten so much dramatic juice out of like an Obi-Wan who's saying, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. And then decides not to, because he really does see him as pathetic. Um, Anyway, I think that could have been incredibly powerful instead of feeling kind of like, oh, of course he doesn't kill him. Scene's over. But everything yeah. up to that, including the part of his face getting revealed and like the mixture of Hayden Christensen and James Earl Jones's voice as the as like the the mask was breaking, all that stuff was so like a deep emotionally and powerful for me that like I kept I kept kind of what 
what you guys were saying. Like you kept wanting to take the parts that worked about this series and right. mash them together into one thing that would have really worked. I think we have we've, we haven't even said the name Riva up to this point. Um, yeah. I think that if you if you say on paper what her story is, oh she's a she's a youngling who survived Anakin's attack at the temple who has gone on to hate him and has infiltrated the Empire as an Inquisitor so she can get close to Darth Vader to get revenge. That sounds like a really good story. I don't, awesome. I don't know that we got that we don't. We didn't. They didn't deliver on the awesome of that setup. And nothing against Moses Ingram. Her performance was not the problem, really. This story was just strangely paced. Like f for what it turned out to be, there was a lot of kind of pointless stuff in the middle, and then stuff on either end that should have been developed better. Because I think you could have had that essential arc of yeah. we we get to know some Inquisitors. There's a partnership between Obi Wan and this Inquisitor in an effort to bring Darth Vader down. Um, you know, I think you could have had all of that happen in a story that felt more focused and more interesting. I, I also found uh, right. Ewan's last interaction with Leia to be a really sweet moment. I thought some of that stuff was, um, you know, emotionally affecting and well written and well acted. Um, but yeah, it, I, I just don't think this. I don't think they've gotten the handle on it. I think some of these Marvel shows are the same way. They just don't really have a handle on like. You said it. You said it a couple of weeks ago, Steve. It's like there, you have to have a story. It can't just be that it's Obi Wan. It can't just be that it's Star Wars. It can't just be that it's Marvel. You actually have to have a story that you want to tell us. I was gonna. I guess that's what I was kind of getting at. I don't know if the last fight that I'm referring to was earned, and based on the end of the the last trilogy we saw, I don't know if they have a shorthand enough for me to want to see a full length film from them anytime soon. If if that if the end of that trilogy is what we're gonna get, I don't want it. And if this is what, what we're gonna see, I don't want it. So like, I, I you know maybe maybe <laughs> the maybe the shows will help get them to a pace where they're like, okay, Taika's movies starting in they're starting to film in twenty twenty three, which sucks that they haven't started yet. But <laughs> the idea the idea that like that's the next Star Wars movie that we might see, I'm okay with watching a couple more shows i just want one to be good though can we give it can we get like is Ron, how about this how about this the next star wars movie is just lavar oh. burton on the set of star trek reading <laughs> star wars stories <laughs> that would be crazy i think the internet would explode doing I mean, all the voices no i know what you mean uh, they see the thing is that's what i that's what i liked about this the that, that fight is that it felt like star wars to me and there have been moments you yeah. Ewan mcgregor was good at delivering these you know some character moments even Hayden Christensen's presence brought some weight to it. I, I kind of enjoy the idea that Obi-Wan was made to to appeal to fans of the prequels the same way that The Force Awakens was made to appeal to fans of the original trilogy. I, I like that sort of synergy. I think they could have even done a better job of, if they're going to keep hacking away at these little bits, like I said, of the timeline, I think they could have just done a better job of explaining, like, what's the arc? Because the idea that Obi-Wan goes from thinking maybe that Anakin is dead to finding out that he's Darth Vader to deciding it's not on me to kill Darth Vader, which is like a weird decision. But there's that whole thing in um, Lord of the Rings where Gandalf is talking to Frodo about why Bilbo didn't kill Gollum, you know, when they had this moment where he could have. And he says something like it was it was pity that stayed his hand or mercy. And he kind of says, like, how important that can be, how a, a moment of mercy can be so important. And the idea that someone has a role to play. And if mm. you watch The Lord of the Rings, you discover that if Gollum were not around, uh, Frodo might have turned evil at the last minute, that it's really Gollum. That's the reason that the ring gets destroyed. And that was a very nerdy tangent. But I'm just saying, <laughs> I think that that idea of like they could have played that moment of Obi-Wan maybe sensing wait a minute there's a reason to leave anakin skywalker alive it's like he he one day is going to be the one to take down palpatine um for 20 years or whatever until he comes back in the rise of skywalker but um this story has gotten so tangled and you're right steve you kind of do have to squint and just just think about the parts that you like yeah, um, and and that's kind of a shame it's a shame it to is, say because it, it does feel like they had they had teed up something really bold and interesting when they brought this back and i know that people differ on the force awakens saying it was a rehash of a new hope but i think that like star wars does feel less special now uh for whatever reason and even though i'm still going to be on the hook for probably whatever they're doing at least for the foreseeable future i, I you know i agree it's a tv show now and it's just a pretty good tv show it's not like the, my favorite tv show it's not in my top five tv shows it's crazy you know? it's crazy yeah yeah um Speaking of something that would probably be in my top five TV shows, one of the things I wanted to mention 
on this uh, also part of discussion uh, of discussing what we've seen is a new series on uh, FX slash Hulu called The Bear. Have either of you watched this? No, of it's on course. my short list, though. <laughs> of course I watched yeah, The so, Bear. So this is a show that will be probably on a top list of a lot of people by the yeah, end yeah. of the year. This I is mandatory so. viewing, John. You've got to get on this show. No, it looks really watchable and interesting. And the funny thing is I've witnessed this kind of Twitter debate about um, the authenticity or not of the Chicago piece that a lot of people, Chicago yeah. people are complaining about. But so th- I, I was more clued into that than I was what the show actually was. And then okay. I finally I finally watched like a trailer and I was like, oh, that show looks super fun. You know, it was I, I had to shake off the sort of debate that people were having online about whether it's whether it's a true representation of the Chicago culinary scene or whatever, because somehow a lot of people right. on my Twitter feed, that's what they were talking about. So anyway, um <clears throat> I got it. Yeah, check it out. but it looks really I, I, fun. And what's that it, guy's it, name? That actor. It's lead. it's it's great. It's um Jeremy Allen White. Most people would know him from like Lip on Shameless, but he was also in that movie The Rental that we talked about on the podcast quite a bit. Yes, which which um, I really loved, honestly. But um, yeah, dude. Honestly, like I knew nothing about this show. It popped up on the feed, and I was like, oh, I like that. I really like him as an actor. He's one of those guys that like everything I see him in. I, I like him the most usually in terms of the performances. And uh, when I watched the trailer, you know, um, even uh, Moss Backrack also came up in the trailer and that's a face you'll know once you see him. Um, he was most recently in the, uh, the uh, Elizabeth home drop Elizabeth Holmes dropout series on Hulu. Uh, he played the reporter that kind of broke the whole story open. Okay. But, um, I like him. He's th- those two are incredible in the show the, in the in the bear, but um, the whole cast is just really, just really great. Um, and yeah, it's 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 interesting to hear about that Twitter debate. I have I had to look into that because like I I feel like I I love what I love most about the show is really kind of like that lived in family feel that it really kind of the idea of the show is that this 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 um, character Carm who's played by. Uh, by uh, Jeremy Allen White comes back to Chicago to take over this restaurant um, that his brother left to him. His brother has died. And it's really just about him kind of getting in with the cast of characters that, you know, work at the restaurant, his, um, his friend, Richie, uh, who they, they call each other cousin um, and just kind of learning more about this restaurant and really, really what, what's happened since he left town. Cause he's, he kind of left town and went off and became like, a world renowned culinary chef working at one of the best restaurants in the world. And he's kind of now come back and working at this little, this, this beef shop, you know, in, 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 or, on, on Orlean street, it's based off of real a place in Chicago. I think it was actually even shot there. Um, but just incredible show. Like it's only eight episodes, 20, 30 minutes an episode, uh, I guess 30 minutes an episode. Um, but just outstanding cast. Um, and you know it's not a spoiler but i'm going to just say real quick john barenthal pops up in this show and he's one of my mvps of everything yeah. and uh you know the moments that he has in this show are some of my favorite moments i've seen i think in a, in a show all year um and but yeah i don't know he, he's not in it a lot but just like his presence is felt for sure and it fits right in with this idea of like you know, the uh, Chicago Italian family and like just what this family owned business looks like. Um, it's a really gorgeous show. It's really well shot. Again, all the performances are great. I can't remember the name of the actress who plays Sydney, one of the sous chefs. Uh, his like, uh, Ayo, Ido Edebiri. Okay. Yeah. She, so she's a comic. She's like one of those comics that's like on the, she's like on the cusp of becoming a really famous comic. Yeah, I recognize um, her voice from yeah. uh from um Big Mouth, right? Big Mouth, yeah, exactly. Yep, Big Mouth. Yeah, and she so was also she, in Dickinson. She's she's like one of those people that's kind of on the cusp of being up there with like, you know, all the famous comics that are kind of on the cusp of shaking gotcha. shit up. Like she's okay. there. She's like right there. She's one of those people that like started doing comedy and can do an hour of stand-up. That kind of level of yeah, she's amazing. she's incredible. She, she's yeah, incredible. She's so, so you know, there's a there's a standout moment that really tells me like how things are kind of evolving in terms of uh, the way black women are being portrayed on TV. Mm-hmm. There's a scene where she's really upset 
um with with a guy that's managing the store played by uh what's what's the guy's name again uh, jeremy lip. Uh, yeah yeah <laughs> lip uh, jeremy i'm gonna call him a lip jeremy yeah. On the way, yeah so uh she kind of pulls him Just up lip. and is like look i don't i feel like you're not giving me any agency in this space and she explains to him in a real way that didn't feel like preachy or what 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 kids call like twitter woke or whatever how he made her feel a scene that i never would have seen before like two three years ago and it's done in such a cool fucking way it's it's like everybody kind of maintains their ego while still explaining how he made her feel and it's just it made me kind of teary-eyed because like i i don't see things like that you don't see white dudes making space for other people and you don't see black women having the agency to explain themselves and a guy kind of being like i fucked up i I wasn't good in this situation i could have been better it fucked me up man it like really made me feel crazy because like it's crazy to think that our our kids are going to be able to see more stuff that has like balance to it yeah right isn't that weird like that's like a like balance and like like accountability accountability fully realized characters and everybody feels so real in it they give everybody- like accountability without pushback and without like yeah it's like archie bunker or whatever like we're moving yeah, past that-, that i mean not to say that that's not good yeah, but yeah. we're moving yeah. past that like okay it's enough just to show that this person yeah. is out of step it's like no watch somebody actually like embrace the, yeah the the feedback so to speak and his, his cousin is an asshole that doesn't hate people because they're like black or what he he hates people because they're getting in the way of his fun i fucking <laughs> love that it's like it's such a cool well done show that i don't know man like it's it's a sleeper it you know i kind of you know mentioned it in the group chat because we we watched them all at once and fucking like my mind was blown by how well it was done and it's such a you know that thing that little things they do that you could tell it was filmed during COVID. Like they don't really show people in the restaurant. They, they have something outside, you know, they, but they, they do it in a really cool way to make it not feel very evident that right. it's only something that somebody that watches a ton of movies would notice, but they handle COVID in a way that doesn't feel too weird. But um, yeah, the bears. Whew. <laughs> Yeah, it's produced by Hiro Mirai also, like just for some pedigree here. Wow. There you go. It's got, it's got some quality behind that. Matty Matheson is in the show and he's also a producer. Um, but just in terms of the, the the food world, you know, his presence there is fun. Um, so he plays, he well, plays hearing the Hero Mirai is part of it just makes me think that the it must be a, a good looking show because that's it's gorgeous. That's, that's it really is. It's, it's great. It's, it's really. Um, but yeah, it's like yeah, a dramedy. It's it's more of a drama, but it is it is very funny. Like specifically, the the interactions between Carm and Richie, and Richie and really with anybody because Richie's kind of like a standout character. Um, what did you just realize, Ronald? Okay, so um, there's there's something that I meant to talk to you guys about. <clears throat> there's a um, I think I might have talked to you about this, but so there's a shot in the movie that's that's like one continuous shot. Um, that I would say is um, incredible. Like when when shit starts to hit the fan, it's like one continuous shot. Um, so to counter that, I I have to think that Hero took some of that from a movie called Boiling Point that came out last year. It is a one shot restaurant movie that is fucking oh I a saw that fucking masterpiece. That's with. Oh, what's that guy's name? The gangster guy. Yeah, the gangster guy. <laughs> the gangster guy. The, so, yeah, yo, the, that that guy. Yep. Do yourself, do yourself a favor, and watch Boiling Point, man. It's it's like one day uh, what's in name? a restaurant. Steven something. Um, um, Stephen Graham. Graham, right, 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 right. Yeah. So I couldn't help but think that this scene was kind of borrowed the format of Boiling Point which was the entire movie done in one take. Uh, so, you know, if you like the bear, if you really enjoy that, you're like, oh, I want to see something else. A rest that has a restaurant dramedy sort of thing. Well, Stephen Graham, Boy, the guy who played Al Capone on Boardwalk yes. Empire? Okay, I love him. So Yeah, yeah he's, he's so good. And, and, and it's a little different, man. He's a little different in this than he's, he's a, he's very subtle. Like he doesn't get too angry. He gets angry, but he doesn't get like, 
Al Capone angry in it. He doesn't murder people. He doesn't murder. <laughs> he doesn't murder anybody, or at least not on purpose. Mm. Uh, but yeah, um, the bear is so good. Check out Boiling Point as well. Um, well, we're running a little long, but I did see a couple other movies. Did anybody see any any movies either in the theater or at home? No. Nah. I did want to suggest a movie. If you guys, if you guys are home movie watchers, <laughs> buy, run, do not walk to get Edge of Tomorrow on 4K Blu-ray. <laughs> guys, this movie is gorgeous. It is it is a fun Groundhog's Day movie if you haven't seen it. Um, and just the sound is will test your sound bar. It will test. It will push it to the limit. It is so fucking amazing. So, and then there's Tom Cruise just being, what I really like about this movie in particular is this is Tom Cruise being a little more vulnerable. He doesn't know how to do everything when he first starts the movie. You know, he's like very confused and scared and worried. You know, there's just a general worry in his face for like the first 40 minutes of this film. Um, but I got I got my hands on an early copy of uh, the 4K Blu-ray, and this thing is like, this is this is why people buy things in a, for for home. You know, <clears throat> this is why people have, you know, a 40 42 inch screen, 46 inch screen, you know, to watch something like this. It is gorgeous. Check this fucking movie is, out. Is it called Edge of Tomorrow on the 4K, or is it called Live, it, Die, it, Repeat? Edge it is, but I think they have like slip covers that have uh, yeah. the alternate title. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. Yeah, I've seen it oh, at store. I saw it at the store, uh, and it's it's like live, die, repeat colon edge of tomorrow. Yeah, which is so man. weird how they screwed that it's whole title. So up. Weird. You know, if if you oh, if you don't want to buy it right when it comes out, wait a couple weeks. It's gonna get a little cheaper, but buy this fucking movie. You will not believe how gorgeous it looks. <laughs> Oh. And this is one of those kind of like recent classics, right? This is one of those movies that just gains in reputation because anybody that hasn't seen it, there's like a strong chance when they watch it that they're going to go, oh, this is really good. This is like better than I thought. This is like yeah. people, even people that don't like Tom Cruise might like seeing him play a little bit more of like, as we have said on this show, the fun of this movie is watching him play kind of a weaselly version of the guy he normally plays and then yeah, watching yeah. him t like take his lumps, you know, to get to be the guy that he normally is at the beginning of the movie. So I think there is, there is something special about this. Uh, and yeah, I haven't, I haven't rewatched it honestly since it first came out. So I think I might be due for like a, a, a you know, but t sitting down and really enjoying how well done this is. So I, was, I yeah, think man. this is the movie that really spawned my, like, I love Emily Blunt now. And I think this was the movie that like, Oh, she's so good that at it. Made man. me do that. Um, well, I'll just kind of rattle off a few things here. I don't know if any of you have seen uh, Men, the Alex Garland movie. Oh, no, please um, tell me what you thought you know, of it. It's like this is one of those movies that kind of goes crazy, like the movie Mother or uh, mm. another Jesse oh. Buckley movie. I'm thinking of Ending Things or even Alex Garland's own movie, Annihilation, where there's like a, a surreal third act <laughs> that's going to trade more on theme and message rather than plot, you know? And I think okay. a lot of people, I see people having a bad reaction to this movie, although it's not like it's gotten bad reviews. It's gotten kind of a, a mixed response. I really enjoyed Men. I, th I do think that um, it might be... <sighs> Like, I like the atmosphere so much and I like the tricks it's pulling on your mood so much that I don't mind that that's what it is, is like a mood piece and that it really does resolve itself. If, you know, if you if you liked Annihilation, for instance, and how conceptual that movie gets at the end, um, or even if you didn't like it, you might appreciate that Alex Garland is a guy who goes for these big ideas and pulls them off visually in a way that's really unique and special. And as a okay. fan of like horror fiction and, and, you know, weird fiction, I love that he's a director who works on that scale, who actually does sort of hew close to these ideas that can be very abstract in in, in horror, you know, where it is, it is sort of nightmarish. And th there's a side of men that seems like um, it's a, it's like, 
if all this movie does is kind of reflect a lot of images of toxic masculinity for men to see and to sit down and watch a movie where you're seeing so many bad images and so many like varying on like, oh, this is a pretty benign guy, but you can see how he's misogynist. And then this guy's more offensively misogynist. And and they're all played by Rory Kinnear, the character actor Rory Kinnear, who is great in, in every scene. Uh, Jesse Buckley is always great, and she's really good in this too. Those performances are so great that to me, it kind of patched over the fact that this is a very weird movie that just hits a certain point and then just keeps getting weirder, but it's sufficiently horrific. And what happens, you can kind of tell the story of what's going on. I wouldn't want to say more to you guys right now, but you know, once we've all seen it, it there's a sort of straight horror interpretation you could put on this of like what sort of what she's encountering really in this story. But it is a bit like rather than viewing this as like a feminist movie that's directed at women, I kind of feel like this is a movie that's that really is meant to rub men's noses in like this these just despicable portraits of, you know, exaggerated versions, maybe, but of some pretty common male uh, archetypes and traits. Um, even her damage, she's a widow or uh, a widow at the beginning of the story. And the story of what happened to her husband is horrific and sad. And even that is is drenched in like, like, what surely must be a common experience for women to experience like, Oh, this guy's like unstable and he's using his instability as a way to imprison me because I feel too guilty to leave him. And, you know, it's just twisted from the beginning, but it's, it's really, the atmosphere is amazing. The look and feel of it is amazing. This could be a very divisive movie, but, but I found it really watchable. And one thing it does is it really makes you think about like images of women alone, like walking in the woods or walking in a big house. Movies use that image a lot of times to create a sense of vulnerability. Mm. And this movie kind of, I felt like sort of pokes at that idea a little bit of like, why are you assuming that this woman is vulnerable? because she's alone. Like women should be able to see a woman alone in the wilderness and feel empowered by that image, you know, or at least not feel like, oh, this woman's in danger. She should have a man with her, you know? <laughs> I, yeah, this movie yeah. really makes you think a lot about would you be better off without a man with you or with a man with you? Um, so I'll quickly go through these other movies. I saw uh, 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 Crimes of the Future, the new David Cronenberg How movie. was that? I mean, You're I don't know where all the movies I wanted to watch. I don't know. It's like it depends on where you stand on Cronenberg. This is like a weirdly emotionally unengaging movie, but it might, might be a strength when you think about um, Cronenberg's kind of chilly style. It's full of weird conversations between really good actors playing kind of bored characters, and it's got <laughs> grotesque imagery in it. I mean, it's a premise of a future where there's no more infection. And pain is somehow cured. So no one feels pain and you don't get infected. And so people have these like open wounds that they that they like indulge in, like the way you would do body modification now. You're doing like wounds and like public surgery. And there's also like a character played by Viggo Mortensen who's growing extra organs that are kind of like cancers, but they turn out to be these weird little organs that that then get removed in these public performance art pieces. It's just, it's all very strange. And if you describe it, it'll sound like a wild, wild movie, but it's actually kind of so emotionally aloof that it is kind of, it is kind of dull. Again, I think people who love Cronenberg's style might really appreciate how kind of deadpan it is. And it does have some, you know, it is fun to see some of these actors do some of these things. Um, but, Dang. but, but yeah, for me, it was, it was, an, it was a bit of a slog getting to the end of it. Um, but, you know, if you like Cronenberg and I stress, if you like that body horror extreme version of Cronenberg, this movie is almost like, a, a you know, a, a smorgasbord of, of grotesque images like that. Um, Jesus. And then lastly, I'll say uh, the black phone. I saw the, the Scott Derrickson joint that's in theaters right now. Can't wait to see this. And oh. I kind of feel like if you know Scott Derrickson's career, and especially if you know who he is as a person on Twitter, and like, like maybe he's left Twitter, but he used to be pretty open about his life on Twitter. And I got a sense of that he's kind of like Mike Flanagan. He's like a guy who has a certain amount of faith and a certain amount of philosophy about that stuff in his life, and he brings it into horror. And I don't think he quite has the, he's not quite as a, accomplished as Flanagan with like the, his visual style, but he's also kind of leaner and meaner and maybe does straight horror more effectively in a way than Mike Flanagan does. Um, and this movie is like kind of ex like if you if you know Scott Derrickson's career and you know that he was supposed to do Doctor Strange 2 and then left because he and Marvel couldn't agree on the tone and then Sam Raimi came in. And of course, even he couldn't complain about being replaced by Sam Raimi, you know, so he walked away from that and then made this. And it's like this is the movie you would want Scott Derrickson to make. 
uh, if you know his career and you know that he just walked away from a bit or parted ways with a big franchise, this is right. like, it feels very personal. Um, and it feels, you know, it's not perfect and it does kind of drag in the midsection a little because the setting of it is kind of limited. And there's one moment of, of what should be like the most horrific moment in the movie that is not very surprising. It's telegraphed and it's like a C it's a bit of CGI kind of gore that just could have been way better. But outside of mm. those little stumbles, this was a really kind of unique and affecting movie. And not just because it's based on a story by Stephen King's son, Joe Hill, but, um, uh, uh, it does have a Stephen Kingish kind of feel in that you don't just get the, it's not just a slasher in the sense of your killer and victim. You also have like, oh, the family of the victim and the town and the cops and everybody has a little bit of a storyline. And I really do feel like for Scott Derrickson, this does feel like a, a you know, kind of a, a, a bold, like somehow it's an expansion of what we've seen him do before. Right, um, right. And and the some it's not really that scary, but it does have two or three images that have stuck with me since seeing it. And you know, the elephant in the room is Ethan Hawke's performance. Uh, you know, he really embraces the chance to do something. You know, that's in in his on brand for him and his performances, but like a really creepy persona that is more about implication than it is about what actually happens on screen in the movie. But. Right. Um, the one thing I'll also say is just when you're juggling a lot of things, you've got a serial killer, you've got supernatural elements, you've mm. got police thriller stuff. Th there's so much going on. It is a little bit hard for some of the scares to connect as like legit scares that if it were maybe just the serial killer element, it might have been a creepier movie. But the way that it brings in the supernatural elements is another thing that made me think of Stephen King, where it's like he might just throw a psychic kid into a ghost story that involves werewolves, you know, like it's it's that kind of <laughs> mix of things. But um. I, you know, I think that if you you see the response this movie's getting, people are people are are appreciating the fact that it feels kind of like a a sincere attempt to make something new that isn't part seven or a reboot. Um, yeah, and it doesn't feel like it's meant to set up a, a sequel either. Just the the nature of this movie it doesn't even seem like it really could. But um, no, I enjoyed it. <clears throat> yeah, I can't wait to see oh. that. And that's a lot. That's a whole lot. That is a lot. That is a lot. Um, so we, we talked about this before recording, but next week we're going to have a, a probably a big episode too. We're going to talk about the uh, the volume two of Stranger Things season four, which comes out um, well the day this podcast yeah. is being released. So we'll, we'll talk about that next week. And we're going to also um, be able to talk about basically the, the season three as a whole for the boys. Um, the finale will be next week by the time this episode, but next week's episode comes out. So, uh, a lot of TV talk next week, so I'm excited for that because I, I, yeah, I did get caught up on the boys, and um, I'm in line with it right now um, as it airs. So I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about that. Um, yeah, moviefreebie.com is the website. You can go there to find past episodes, subscribe to any of the podcast platforms, uh, whichever one you prefer, and obviously jump onto the socials from that page if you like. Follow us there. You can also hit the YouTube page, subscribe, hit the bell to get notifications when these videos come out. If you want to watch the uh, visual uh, element of this podcast. YouTube is your spot. Um, but we'll be back next week. And uh, as always, you've made our day. Thanks. Bye.